21-year-old Leisha Riley was a smart, talented, soulful young woman with dreams of becoming a writer and perhaps an artist. A student at nearby Buffalo State College, Leisha lived at home with her parents in West Seneca, a town in Erie County, New York. She'd grown up there, had all of her memories there, and tragically, as fate would have it, she would mysteriously disappear from there as well. It was the evening of Wednesday, January 30th, 1985. Leisha headed out with a friend for a few drinks, some laughs, and maybe even a little dancing. Arriving at the Pierce Arrow, a popular night spot in town, the evening began without a hitch and the two friends were having a blast. A few hours later, after midnight, Leisha's friend headed home for the evening, leaving the 21-year-old to find her own ride home. She has never been seen again. Multiple witnesses reported seeing Leisha walking out of the bar alongside another patron. He was no stranger, known to many in the establishment as an off-duty New York State trooper who frequented the local club and bar scene. In the days and weeks following Leisha's disappearance, this man would deny knowing her, leaving with her, or having any knowledge of what might have become of her. Investigators would find themselves handcuffed by an absence of evidence so vacant they couldn't even prove that a crime had been committed. For more than 30 years, Leisha's father fought to keep her name in the public and her story alive. In desperation to retrieve his daughter, give her a proper burial, and see her killer charged and sentenced, he refused to give up the fight. In a letter to his daughter, Patrick Riley promised to return her home and see justice done. Sadly, he passed away before the truth could be learned and Leisha has never been located. Perhaps tonight, someone out there listening might possess the knowledge necessary to help fulfill a father's final promise. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 208, The Disappearance of Leisha Riley. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the mysterious 1985 disappearance of 21-year-old Leisha Riley. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, episode breakdowns, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or by emailing me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Leisha Riley went out for a night of fun and dancing, as she had many times in the past. This night, however, she never returned home, and more than 36 years later, her fate remains unknown. This is Episode 208, The Disappearance of Leisha Riley. The sound of the crowd inside the popular restaurant was mostly contained within the four walls of the building, vibrating lowly off the fogged-over panes of glass in each window. Every time the door swung open as a new patron entered or exited, a cacophony of voices, clinking glasses, and distorted music drifted out across the snow-blanketed pavement of the packed parking lot. As locals laughed, chatted, danced, and sang, icy winds rattled the windows, and kicked up sweeping clouds of snow from thickly packed drifts and banks created in the wake of patrolling snow plows. Around three in the morning, as the party-like atmosphere of the night spot was beginning to die down, that door swung open and out stepped two sets of legs. 21-year-old Leisha M. Riley clung tightly to her long black coat as the chill snap of the early morning hours bid against her pale skin, flushed red from the frosty assault. Stepping out beside the woman was an older man, one known to a handful of people inside the bar, and possibly someone Leisha had encountered in the past. What exactly occurred after Leisha left the bar that night has never been determined. The 21-year-old seemingly vanished from the face of the earth. No trace of her has ever been found, and even the slow buildup of snowflakes drifting from the night sky contributed to the mystery, smoothing out her light footsteps leaving behind a series of only haunting questions. Perhaps most pertinent of them all, what exactly did the man seen with Leisha that night know about her fate? That question remains at the heart of a young woman's disappearance 
and the unfulfilled promise of a grieving father. Leisha M. Riley was born on Saturday, October 5, 1963, in Erie County, New York, to parents Patrick and Suzanne. Leisha would go on to be one of three children born to the family, having both a brother and a sister. She would be raised in the town of West Seneca, a suburb of Buffalo situated in western New York, just five miles east of Lake Erie. At the time of Leisha's birth, West Seneca was in the midst of a large growth spurt, as the decade between 1960 and 1970 would see the town's population exploding by nearly 50%, from 33,000 to 49,000 residents. In her youth, Leisha was described by friends and family as a kind, sweet, and creative youngster who loved literature and art. She was intelligent, driven, and had a gregarious laugh which her family explained often filled the home and delivered a sense of warmth and welcoming. Leisha's interest in the arts would go on to present themselves more strongly as she grew older. She started creating her own works, writing stories and poems while also testing her abilities with a paintbrush. Many would go on to note that Leisha not only had a way with words, but also on the canvas, where she managed to transform the dull white void into vivid landscapes and portraits. She also developed a love of dance and could frequently be found dancing to her favorite music and wanting others to join in with her fun. Outside of the arts, Leisha achieved high grades in school and was frequently noted as being intelligent, conscientious, and driven. Raised in a devout Catholic family, Leisha attended Sunday services each week and would go on to attend Queen of Heaven School, which describes its goal as educating children in a faith-filled Catholic environment. Leisha was close with her family, and as she grew up, her relationships with her parents and siblings only grew stronger. In her teen years, Leisha attended Mount Mercy Academy, a private Roman Catholic high school located in Buffalo, just five miles from her family's Lee Cliff Lane home. Leisha graduated from Mount Mercy Academy in the spring of 1982 and would go on to matriculate at the SUNY Buffalo State College, just 15 miles from home. As she had done throughout her entire scholastic career, Leisha excelled at her studies and continued to write and create art. Many of her paintings and drawings were hung in the family home and continue to hang on the walls today. By that point in her life, Leisha was seriously considering becoming an author. Her childhood friend and neighbor, Joanna Derry Bernardo, described her friend to the Buffalo News, saying, quote, We grew up right across the street from each other. Leisha was a special person. I think about her all the time. Leisha was a very creative, very literate, and very funny person. She was a bright, sweet, spiritual person, end quote. By the end of 1984, Leisha was 21 years old and had been attending Buffalo State for two and a half years. She continued to live with her parents in their Lee Cliff Lane home, worked a part-time job at a local pizza restaurant, and was putting the pieces together toward her future. As her time at college was more than halfway over, the bright young woman was giving serious consideration to where she wanted to go with her life. She dreamed of someday being published, of writing a series of books and making her living as an artist. Unfortunately, before she could even finish school, she would mysteriously vanish following an evening out at a popular local night spot. The evening of Wednesday, January 30th, 1985, was another bitterly cold night in western New York State. With temperatures peaking at just 28 degrees, each gust of wind whipped down the quiet streets of West Seneca like icy needles crashing into bundled-up locals as they made their way home through the frigid night. At approximately 6 p.m., Leisha said goodbye to her parents and headed off for the home of a friend who was throwing a party. After spending an unspecified time at the party, Leisha left with a friend, and the two drove over to a West Seneca bar. Located at 3036 Seneca Street, near the intersection of Center Road, the Pierce Arrow was a popular gathering place for younger locals and was regarded by many as being the center of the singles scene in West Seneca. Spread out over two floors, the Pierce Arrow offered dining, music, drinks, and consistently large crowds. At the time, the club boasted that it was the favored hangout for many members of the NFL's Buffalo Bills. That night, Nearly 200 people were present at the Pierce Arrow, and many of them knew Leisha, either directly through friendship or casually, recognizing her by appearance. Multiple witnesses would later tell investigators that they had seen Leisha arrive, 
and noted that she and her female friend had quickly hit the dance floor, laughing and having a good time. Others stated that Leisha had danced with a few different people that night in addition to her friend, but there didn't appear to be any lingering connections as Leisha wasn't witnessed hanging out particularly long with any guy. According to official reports, after hanging out at the bar for a few hours sometime around midnight, Leisha's friend was getting tired and wanted to go home. She approached the 21-year-old and asked if she was ready to go, but Leisha wanted to hang out for a little while longer. Her friend was hesitant to leave. She had been Leisha's ride that night, but according to this friend, Leisha told her not to worry about it. She'd find a ride home with someone else. There were plenty of people there that she knew. Tragically, this decision has been noted as being the turning point for Leisha, and ultimately, many believe she simply asked the wrong person for a ride that night, resulting in her disappearance. Several hours later, two and a half miles away at Leisha's family home, her parents awoke on Thursday morning and quickly discovered that their daughter had never come home. This was considered highly unusual for her parents, who noted that Leisha wasn't the type to stay out all night without so much as a call. Her father, Patrick, later explained to the Buffalo News, saying, quote, In her whole life, Leisha had never been away from our home for any extended period without letting us know where she was. I knew immediately that next morning that something was wrong. End quote. After making a few calls to friends of Leisha's and quickly discovering that no one had seen her since she had been at the bar the night before, Patrick picked up the phone and contacted the West Seneca Police Department. Filing a missing persons report, Patrick described his daughter to investigators and noted the Pierce Arrow as the last place she had been seen. In hopes of determining where the 21-year-old may have ended up, Detectives began by speaking to friends and working to track down and interview everyone who had been at the bar that night. The first few days of the investigation didn't drum up a whole lot of information. While they managed to track down a number of people who had seen Leisha the night before, the vast majority hadn't seen what time she'd left the bar nor who she had gone with. One thing was certain, temperatures that night had been in the single digits and it was considered highly unlikely that Leisha would have attempted to make the three-mile walk home under those conditions. Not to mention, more than two feet of snow had fallen, and while she had dressed up for a night out, Leisha was definitely not properly equipped to battle the elements. While those closest to Leisha knew something had to be wrong, this was not the way she would normally behave. Others suggested that perhaps she had gone home with a friend and simply fallen asleep and would reach out later. Some floated the possibility that the 21-year-old might have decided to go home with a guy from the bar that night, although again, this was not typical for Leisha. For investigators, the case took a darker turn the following day on Friday, February 1st. Leisha didn't show up for a job interview that she'd been very excited about, and then the next day on Saturday, she didn't show up for her shift at work either. That same day, detectives began shifting their focus. While they had come into the case investigating it as a simple missing person situation, details uncovered in their investigation suggested that Leisha might be in danger. Lieutenant May of the West Seneca Police Department told the news that circumstances indicated a high probability of foul play. He explained, quote, She is definitely missing. She hasn't followed her routine and hasn't kept in touch with anyone. There are a number of things that make this seem very odd. There is no one she was going with that has also disappeared, and no one has seen her. End quote. As detectives tracked down and spoke with more and more of the people seen at the bar that night, one name kept coming up in conversation. According to several witnesses, they had seen Leisha walking out of the bar that night at approximately 3 a.m., but she wasn't alone. Multiple witnesses identified the man with her as 28-year-old Daniel D. Rose. This was a man investigators were very familiar with, not because he'd had a lot of encounters with law enforcement, but because he was a member of law enforcement. At that time, Rose was a New York State trooper working out of their barracks in Boston, New York, 15 miles south of West Seneca. This revelation caught investigators off guard as Leisha had been missing for several days, and yet Rose had not informed his superiors nor anyone at the West Seneca Police Department that he had been in the company of the missing woman the night she vanished. That wasn't the only part of the case that made detectives suspicious. Witnesses also told police that after leaving with Leisha, 
Rose had returned to the bar approximately an hour later, around 3.55 a.m. Upon arriving back at the Pierce Arrow, two witnesses who were friends of Rose said they watched him walk inside and proceed straight to the bathroom before he rejoined them. Edward Tichka, a West Seneca detective, later told reporters that several days after Alicia vanished, Trooper Rose hired a lawyer to represent him during a statement to investigators. His lawyer, Howard J. Boreanaz, a senior partner at the firm of Boreanaz, Cara, and Boreanaz. He was known at the time as one of the state's top defense attorneys. The New York Times would later write about him, giving his list of clients as including people in New York's judiciary, the Buffalo City government, alleged racketeers, and a former mayor of Syracuse. Detective Tichka would describe him as a top defense attorney. Tichka, along with others, were baffled by this move. He explained to the Buffalo News, quote, Well, here's a guy who could help us. He saw the person we were looking for. Why would he not help us? Once he got represented by a lawyer, that put the kibosh on everything we could do. End quote. According to the West Seneca police, in his statement, Rose told investigators that he had arrived at the Pierce Arrow at approximately 11 p.m. on the night of Wednesday, January 30th. He began drinking with several friends, including former Buffalo Bills running back Rob Riddick. Reportedly, Rose told detectives that he had been, quote, consistently drinking, end quote, that night, and estimated that he had spoken to, quote, between six and ten young women, end quote. When shown a photograph of Leisha, Rose apparently stated that he recognized her name and remembered speaking to her that night, but it had only been a brief encounter. When asked about witness statements which placed Rose exiting the bar that night alongside Leisha, he denied this had occurred. Instead, he told detectives that while, yes, he had left the bar around 3 a.m. with a woman, it had not been Leisha. Rose insisted that the woman he went outside with was named Kathy. Whether or not investigators ever managed to track down this alleged Kathy has never been reported, but given their statements, it seems quite apparent they didn't buy the story. According to Rose, he had only been outside with this Kathy for around 20 minutes that night before returning to the bar with his friends. Asked again about Leisha, Rose stated that he had no idea what might have happened to her. Rob Riddick, later asked about that night, told the Buffalo News that he remembered it well because of the tragic disappearance. He explained that he was certain he had seen Rose leaving the bar that night with Leisha around 3 a.m. When informed that Rose had told investigators he did not leave with her, Riddick replied, quote, that's a lie, end quote. Riddick would go on to explain, quote, Danny, I considered him my best friend at that time. I saw him leave with her, and other people who were with us saw the same thing. Danny told me, we'll be right back. End quote. Riddick noted that he had known Rose for a while, and the two often hung out together at local bars and shared a large circle of mutual friends. Riddick stated that he understood 100% why investigators had focused in on Rose, noting that Rose never told him what happened that night, nor did he ever bring it up. In addition to Riddick, investigators also spoke to another friend of Rose's who was present that night. Paul Schwartzmeyer told detectives that he actually stayed over at Rose's apartment that night, located six miles southwest of the bar in nearby Lackawanna. According to Schwartzmeyer, he and Rose left the bar at approximately 4 a.m., just a few minutes after Rose had returned from being gone for nearly an hour. Schwartzmeyer went on to say that after arriving at Rose's apartment, the state trooper told him that he was going to, quote, some girl's house, end quote. Schwartzmeyer went to bed, and when he awoke the next morning around 10 a.m., he found Rose was back in the apartment. When he asked him what had happened the night before, Rose reportedly replied that the girl he'd planned to visit hadn't been home. In addition to this, Schwartzmeyer noted that when he asked Rose about Leisha, Rose told him that he hadn't left the bar with her and instead said the woman he'd left with was a blonde. Though there were gaps in Rose's story and several details which directly contradicted those of other witnesses, investigators didn't believe they had enough evidence to label him as a suspect. Instead, he was taken off road duty pending further investigation. Asked about Rose, Erie County District Attorney Richard J. Arcara refused to discuss the trooper, 
telling the news, quote, right now, our main concern is to locate the woman, end quote. Detectives would spend the next several months gathering information and interviewing additional witnesses in their attempts to locate the missing 21-year-old. Multiple searches were launched and investigators focused in on rural areas, bodies of water, and any place they believed the body could have been concealed. While Rose was unwilling to give any additional information about the night in question, he also didn't wish to discuss the rest of the day either. According to investigators, on Thursday, January 31st, Rose had called out sick to his trooper barracks. When asked what he had done that day, where he had gone, and who he had spent time with, Rose refused to answer. Unfortunately, investigators were left to watch Rose walking out of the police station without being able to do anything about it. In July, some six months after Leisha's disappearance, detectives had failed to uncover any physical evidence as to what might have happened to her. Ten investigators, including two detectives with the New York State Police, had worked countless hours but still had not managed to produce any solid information about the missing woman. More than 200 witnesses were interviewed, and many of them reported having seen Leisha leaving the bar that night in the company of Daniel Rose. Unfortunately, this didn't put them in a position to force him to answer questions, and with his lawyer retained, he hadn't expressed any interest in cooperating with the investigation. In fact, he had told them he was done. Given that half a year had passed without so much as a peep from Leisha, detectives believe she had been the victim of a homicide. Captain Leroy Tudor of the West Seneca Police explained to reporters, saying, quote, We have nothing in the way of physical evidence which pinpoints a death, but her complete disappearance? People don't disappear from the face of the earth without something occurring. End quote. Combined efforts from both police agencies and multiple searches utilizing helicopters, tracking dogs, and cadaver dogs failed to turn up anything. Since detectives didn't have any information to work with in terms of where Leisha may have been taken after she left the bar, many of their searches focused in on areas close to the bar itself. Lieutenant Michael Wright, Director of Public Information for the State Police, informed the news that Daniel Rose had been relieved of duty and was no longer a trooper. Asked why he had been terminated and whether or not it had anything to do with Alicia's disappearance, Wright declined to comment any further. Later statements issued by the state police would only vaguely note that Rose's dismissal had come as the result of job performance issues. Rose had worked as a trooper for five years before being let go. Acknowledging how frustrating and difficult it was for the family, investigators pleaded with the public to come forward with whatever information they might possess. Without something more concrete, they didn't even have the ability to officially classify the case as a homicide investigation. Detective Raymond Slade told the news that while they lacked evidence, he fully believed Leisha had been killed the night she disappeared and her killer managed to hide her body in a location that they'd yet to uncover. When Captain Tudor was asked if he believed it was possible she could still be alive, he simply replied, quote, My gut feeling is that she is not. My prayer is that she is, end quote. For the next six months, investigators lingered in the same uncertain space. While they had multiple witnesses who confirmed seeing Leisha leave the bar with Rose that night, legally, there was very little they could do unless physical evidence turned up, including Leisha's body. They would spend the rest of the year searching and investigating while Leisha's family struggled with all of the painful grief-stricken firsts that the families of the lost must face. October marked what would have been Leisha's 22nd birthday. November brought a solemn Thanksgiving with a notable empty seat at the table. December ushered in a hollow Christmas and the arrival of a new year filled with frustration and doubt. The one-year anniversary of Leisha's disappearance came quickly and hit harder than anyone could have imagined, driving home the harsh reality that this intelligent, beautiful, talented, and hardworking young woman was never coming home. Then. Investigators received a call from a tipster who claimed to know the location of Leisha's remains. A dozen investigators made the 26-mile trip southeast of West Seneca and arrived at the Chaffee Landfill, located at 10860 Olean Road, to begin a search. Reportedly, the caller had claimed that Leisha's body may have been disposed of in a garbage dumpster within hours of her disappearance, and as a result, 
may have been dumped in this landfill and gone unnoticed by employees. The search officially began on Tuesday, February 4th, 1986, a year and four days since Leisha had last been seen. It was a difficult area for investigators to look through as, first, they needed employees at the landfill to mark off for them all the areas in which dumpsters and garbage were dumped during the month-long period following Leisha's disappearance, covering the last week of January through the last week of February 1985. Hoping to temper the community's response to the search, Captain Tudor told the media that the search did not signify anything major. In his own words, it was routine. The landfill search was long, extensive, and involved the use of heavy machinery, scent tracking dogs, and cadaver dogs. The search was officially called off on Wednesday, February 26th, and the district attorney, John Arcara, noted that they had spent so much time searching that site because their goal was to exhaust all possibilities. In the end, Arcara stated that investigators had dug down through 30 feet of refuse and waste in their search for Leisha, but again, had failed to locate anything significant. Had their tip been accurate, had they searched the wrong area, or had her killer since moved the body, no one could say for sure. Leisha's father, Patrick, complimented investigators on their hard work and determination to locate his daughter and hopefully find out what happened to her that cold January night. Though the family had preferred to remain in the background, not wanting to involve themselves with the media, Patrick stepped up as the key representative of his family and of his daughter. Asked his thoughts, Patrick replied, quote, I want justice, not sympathy. I'm convinced that we have a psychotic killer who is loose in this community, and it greatly distresses me that he could kill again. I know what my family has gone through. I don't want anybody else to go through that. End quote. Patrick told reporters that he believed all of the evidence pointed only towards one individual. He hoped that someone, anyone who knew the killer or had knowledge of the crime would come forward and end the horrifying situation his family found themselves in. He pleaded, quote, whether that person is a family member or friend, they should step forward. Not because of Leisha, because that can't be undone, but they would be morally responsible if he killed again. I think you have a responsibility to humanity, end quote. Patrick went on to say that his family had been incapable of enjoying anything since Leisha disappeared. He explained, quote, intellectually, we know that Leisha has been killed. But emotionally, it's difficult to accept. Imagine having an incapacity for joy. That's what we have. In Leisha's case, we've all been robbed of her potential. In my biased, subjective judgment, she was a special person, a very forgiving soul. End quote. The next month in March, District Attorney Arcara announced authorities would be offering a $10,000 reward for information leading to the discovery of the missing woman or the arrest of her suspected killer. Arcara announced that the reward was being offered, quote, to secure the support, cooperation, and meaningful assistance of the general public in the discovery of the whereabouts of Leisha Riley or the arrest of any individual responsible for any crime relative to her disappearance, end quote. Unfortunately, This reward offered it an unleash a deluge of tips, nor did it seem to encourage anyone who might have had information to reach out. At that time, Leisha's case fell somewhat into limbo. The investigation continued, but without something substantial, there was little police could do to advance it. Soon, Leisha's case faded from the headlines, and days turned to weeks, weeks to months, and months to years. On January 31st, 1989, four years since Leisha vanished, there hadn't been any updates regarding the case, and in hopes of keeping the story alive, Patrick Riley sat down for an interview with the Buffalo News, as did several investigators assigned to the case. Patrick told reporters that while it was still painful to talk about his daughter, he found it was even more painful to not talk about her, as though she had never existed. While Patrick acknowledged that finding Leisha's body wouldn't bring her back, he did note, quote, We suffer daily, and if we could find her body and prosecute, we would suffer less. Finding her would make a terrible situation less terrible. Time does not heal all wounds, not when there's no finality. I am pleading with someone to come forward. 
Even terrorists allow their victims' families to give them a proper burial. It's important to us that we give her a proper burial, that we give her a church service. End quote. Patrick continued that after finding his daughter's body, the next step would be to ensure the person who murdered her was arrested and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Investigators couldn't be as direct, saying that while they believed she was dead, they hadn't come upon any evidence to confirm that any crime had taken place. Russell Anderson, captain of the West Seneca Detectives Bureau, told the news, quote, We're still investigating. We still get occasional phone calls and check them out. I am 99% sure she's dead, end quote. Joseph Cooley, an investigator with the state police, explained that while a lack of evidence had frustrated detectives for years after Leisha's disappearance, they now also had to contend with the passage of time. He explained, quote, It's becoming more difficult. Memories fade. Many times old killings are solved. Perhaps one of the people who's aware of what happened will come up against it legally. He needs a break, and he comes forward. End quote. Despite having retired from active law enforcement work, both Leroy Tudor and Raymond Slade continued to be involved in the case, speaking with investigators and keeping in touch with the Riley family. Tudor, who retired in 1987, told the news, quote, Oh yeah, I think about it. Just the other day, I was thinking that maybe we should go back over the file and see what we missed. End quote. Tudor noted that while they believed Alicia was dead, he could not discuss the reason for this belief. Raymond Slade said that he maintained contact with Joseph Cooley on the case and continued to give his input on the investigation. Having retired a year earlier in 1988, Slade acknowledged his frustration with the case, saying, quote, I still ask myself, where did he put her? I'm really unhappy about it considering the amount of effort that was put into it. Joe Cooley and I didn't take a day off from the 1st of February to the 1st of May in 1985. We just kept plugging away, but we never got anywhere. End quote. According to the former investigators, the killer's best advantage wasn't his cunning, his planning, or his execution of the crime. It could be all chalked up to little more than dumb luck, as no witnesses saw anything after Leisha left the bar. It was as if she vanished into nothing as soon as she stepped outside. Only one person might possess the answers to her fate, but he hadn't spoken to detectives since the weeks after the 21-year-old had gone missing. That strikes the Riley family soundly in the heart, with Patrick noting that they believed former state trooper Daniel D. Rose was actively concealing information about their daughter. Erie County District Attorney Kevin Dillon told the Buffalo News that the case had never been presented to a grand jury because there was not enough evidence to present to them. Without a body or additional evidence, they couldn't try and prosecute anyone. Frustrated, Patrick explained his own views, saying, quote, This has taught us how fragile life is and how fragile some of our institutions are, such as the criminal justice system, when it protects the guilty at the expense of the innocent. End quote. Patrick ended the interview by noting that while he couldn't really criticize investigators, he also could not be satisfied with them, at least not until his daughter was found. Two years later, in 1991, on the sixth anniversary of Leisha's disappearance, investigators were a little more direct in their discussion of the case. Still acknowledging that without a body, it was hard to do anything, State Police Captain Bruce Roloff told the news, quote, We have a suspect, that is, we have a suspect if we have a crime, end quote. While no one would name the suspect, multiple news outlets reported that it was a former state trooper who had been seen by witnesses with Leisha the night she vanished. Detective Edward Tichka and Richard Smith concurred with Roloff and added that they didn't believe this had been a premeditated crime. They theorized that Leisha left the bar with her assailant, perhaps to get a ride home, and something went wrong. The theory bandied about most commonly suggested that Leisha may have been murdered as the result of her denying her killer's sexual advances. Both detectives stated that the investigation was progressing, not just continuing to be investigated. They still received calls about the case and followed up on all leads and information as it became available. One curious detail to come out during this interview 
had to do with a missing persons flyer, which had been posted in the West Seneca Police Department in the days after Leisha's disappearance. The flyer showed a photo of Leisha, as well as one of Daniel Rose, which was underscored by the sentence, she was last seen with this man. However, neither the police nor the Riley family know where that flyer came from. Both sides deny having created it, leading many to wonder if perhaps someone inside of the department or perhaps the state police was trying to make it clear exactly who they believed was responsible. It was also revealed that, in desperation for answers, the Riley family had enlisted the services of an alleged psychic from New Jersey. According to detectives, she provided them with some information which opened up different investigative avenues. However, they weren't exactly sold on her alleged abilities. Asked about her assistance, Captain Roloff said it could be helpful to keep an open mind about so-called psychics, but he added, quote, if we really had a lot of faith in them, we'd have one on staff, end quote. Asked about the status of the case and the search for his daughter's killer, Patrick Riley explained, quote, I have a high commitment to seeking justice, not revenge, and whatever means will lead to that, however bizarre they might seem, I'm willing to try. We can't bring her back, but if it takes another year or two to get hard evidence, it's worth the wait. Attica Prison will still be there. Since she's dead, we have all the time in the world. I can't let it rest. She's not at rest. If your little girl was put God knows where, would you? End quote. January 31st, 1995 marked 10 long years since Leisha had vanished. For a decade, her family endured the pain and tragedy of her loss while being overwhelmed by the utter lack of evidence developed by investigators. Patrick wanted to make sure the killer knew he was never going to give up, telling reporters, quote, We're still after you. As long as I'm alive, he's got a problem because I'm not going to let this go. Either he has a conscience and it's eating him up or he is a psychopath and will slip up, end quote. Detective Edward Tichka, when asked about the former state trooper, noted that he had never left their minds, saying, quote, We still keep tabs on him. There is still hope. If we found a body, we feel we could make a case. End quote. Major Pedro Perez of the state police confirmed that the investigation was still being worked and added that he had done some undercover work, though he would not specify what exactly had been learned, if anything. While investigators noted their frustration and their sadness that they had not been able to bring closure to the family, Patrick made it clear that the pain he and his family experienced on a daily basis would never be enough to get them to forget, to forgive, or to move on. He stated, quote, There's not a day that goes by that I don't think of her. We are victims too, because we've been deprived of our daughter, and the world has been deprived of her too. I really think she would have made a difference. People tell us we're strong and courageous, but we're just trying to make the best of a bad situation. You can either jump off a bridge or get on with your life. We've chosen to get on with it. End quote. Unfortunately, the rest of the 90s would pass without any new information, without any movement on the case, and without bringing anyone closer to finding Leisha or the person who was responsible for her disappearance and likely death. On March 22nd, 2003, former investigator Raymond Slade passed away after a short illness at the age of 75. Even to his dying days, Slade had maintained contact with Patrick Riley and investigators, hoping that they would finally be able to crack the case. The Buffalo News ran a comprehensive and touching article about Slade and his life, noting the type of detective he was. When asked once, how long should a detective continue investigating a homicide, Slade simply replied, quote, for as long as the victim's still dead, end quote. Thirteen years later, on July 13th, 2016, Leisha's father, Patrick Francis Riley, passed away at the age of 78. For 31 long, hard years, Patrick fought to try and find justice for his daughter, to bring her home, and to give her a proper Catholic burial. Unfortunately, his light was extinguished, and he went to his grave never knowing the truth of what became of his beloved daughter. 
His family sought comfort, however, in Patrick's own belief that when he finally left this mortal life, he might see his daughter again in heaven. Former detective Edward Tichka was emotional about Patrick's passing, saying, quote, he was a real gentleman and really broken up about what happened. I never got to call him up and say, we finally made an arrest. He never got closure. I feel bad about that to this day, end quote. Four years later, January of 2020 marked 35 years since Leisha had vanished. This time also represents the last major discussion of this case, at least through the media. Lieutenant Kevin Baranowski, then working the investigation, was directly asked about Daniel Rose and whether or not he was a key suspect in the case. Baranowski replied, quote, I am just going to say what our department has stated right along about Daniel Rose. As far as we can determine, he was the last person seen with Leisha the night she disappeared. Nobody has ever heard from Leisha since she disappeared that night, but we cannot be 100% sure that she's deceased because we never found a body. End quote. According to Baranowski, the case was still active, and as recently as 2017, they had searched a local area after receiving a tip from a caller about where Leisha's body might be. Asked for further details, Baranowski declined, saying only, quote, I don't want the killer to know where we've looked, end quote. While Daniel Rose himself elected not to speak to reporters, his lawyer did answer some questions. While Rose has originally hired Howard J. Boreanaz, the defense attorney passed away in 1993. All these years later, Rose is represented by Boreana's son, Robert. Asked about his client's status, Robert Boreana stated, quote, He's an innocent man. He's never been charged because there's no evidence against him because he didn't do it. Every district attorney who has been in office over the past 35 years has passed on this case because there is no case. The evidence is not there. End quote. Burianas went on to note his belief that none of the witnesses from the bar that night were reliable since they'd all been drinking. John J. Flynn, then Erie County District Attorney, told reporters that he had spoken to investigators about the case recently when they had come to his office. Flynn stated that he would not hesitate to pursue charges should new evidence be found. He explained, quote, Unfortunately, whenever a body cannot be found, that makes it that much more difficult to solve. The deceased body provides us with cause and manner of death evidence. On many occasions, there is DNA evidence from the body. All those potential pieces of evidence are not present when we don't have a body. End quote. When last seen, Leisha M. Riley was described as being a white female with brown hair and eyes, standing five feet, five inches tall, and weighing approximately 120 pounds. Leisha has a large scar on her left knee and moles on her chest, arms, and back. She also has freckles, and her ears are pierced. On the night of her disappearance, Leisha was wearing a black waist-length coat with red trim, a sleeveless, heavy, charcoal-colored jumpsuit with an elastic waist, a round neck sweater with multiple colors, including purple, as well as red perforated shoes with medium heels. She carried a red purse with a shoulder strap. According to multiple witnesses, she was last seen walking out of the former Pierce Arrow, located at 3036 Seneca Street, alongside former New York State Trooper Daniel D. Rose. Leisha was 21 years old at the time of her disappearance, and if alive today, she would have turned 59 years old in October. The disappearance of Leisha Riley is a haunting, frustrating, terrifying case of loss, grief, and deceit. A bright light to those who loved her, her family grieves at the loss of their daughter, sister, cousin, and friend. No words I could ever arrange could possibly express what these last 37 years have been like for Leisha's family and friends, but perhaps those of her father can. This is an excerpt from a letter Patrick wrote to his daughter. 10 years after she vanished. I smile when I think of you and delight in remembering your life and your wonderful contribution to our lives. If you had lived, 
you would have been even more appreciated. A wife, a mother, a friend, an artist, a dancer, a continuing, capable, caring, and loving human being. Can any emotion or feeling compare to how much you are missed? Yes. The knowledge and sense that you would want justice served. Someday, your remains will be found. We will give you a proper burial. He will be arrested, prosecuted, and sentenced. That will not remotely replace you, but it cries out to be done. It will happen. I promise you, it will happen. The disappearance of Leisha Riley is a story of pain, loss, grief, deceit, and frustration. You have a disappearance, which no one actually believes is anything other than a murder, but they can't prove it. Essentially, this is not the search for a missing person, despite its official classification. It's the search for the remains of a bright, talented, lovely young woman who mysteriously vanished after walking out of a bar with a man who later denied knowing her, leaving with her, or knowing anything about what might have happened to her. Regardless of yours, mine, or investigators' opinions, Daniel D. Rose has never been charged with a crime, has never been accused of this crime, and has never been officially listed as a suspect for this crime. Hell, they can't even fully prove that it is a crime. Some newspaper articles refer to him as a suspect, but none of the law enforcement officials working the case have ever gone that far. Perhaps they said something between the lines or made subtle references, but the fact is they lack the evidence necessary to even say he is a suspect. Last week, we discussed the discovery of an unidentified woman found along an interstate in North Carolina. The victim of a homicide, she has never been identified and is known as both the Hillsborough Jane Doe and the New Hope Jane Doe. The disappearance of Leisha Riley is essentially the opposite. While Hillsborough County investigators found themselves with a body and an obvious crime, both the West Seneca and New York State Police were left without a body and no evidence of a crime, but instead, a missing persons case where all of the circumstantial evidence suggests murder, but nothing can be proven. Can you imagine that frustration? To believe you know what happened, to think you're certain of Leisha's fate, and yet you can't find enough evidence to even question the person you consider most likely to be involved? For both investigators and the family, the past three and a half decades have been filled with dead ends, blind alleys, and an utter absence of evidence. Due to the lack of information, the inability to locate her remains, and the absence of people coming forward, it's difficult to know what exactly happened or how to approach the investigation. Essentially, Nothing can be done unless one of two things happens. Leisha's body is found, or someone confesses or provides solid evidence of a crime. As a result of what is known, there's really only one theory in this case, that Leisha was accosted by someone outside of the bar that night. So we'll look at it from a broad perspective before slowly closing in. The Pierce Arrow was a popular bar and restaurant. It wasn't uncommon for the building to be absolutely flush with patrons looking for a few drinks, maybe some dancing, and overall just trying to have a good time. We know that Leisha arrived that night as the friend she came with told police about their travels, and multiple witnesses inside of the bar reported seeing Leisha and knowing her by sight or directly by being her friend or acquaintance. Around midnight, Leisha's friend decides to head home but doesn't want to leave her behind. According to her, Leisha tells her not to worry about it. She'll find her own way home. Not a lot of information has ever been given about all of the people who were present that night who may have known Leisha or had any kind of a history with her. She was a smart woman who knew better than to just trust some random person to get her home that night. So most people believe if indeed she did approach someone or ask for a ride, she'd have made sure it was someone she knew she could trust or believed she could trust. Maybe it just makes sense why she might have asked an off-duty state trooper who was there with his friends. She might have thought to herself, how much safer of a ride home can you get than one from a cop? According to multiple witnesses, including two friends of Daniel Rose who were with him that night, he walked out of the Pierce Arrow with Leisha sometime between 2.55 and 3 a.m. No one knows what happened after that door closed. Did they walk over to Rose's car hop inside and drive off in an unknown direction at which time something goes wrong? 
did Leisha get offended or feel uncomfortable about Rose and change her mind, walking off on her own or perhaps getting out of the car when he came to a stop somewhere? This is the key problem with this case. Seeing Leisha leaving with Rose doesn't provide evidence that he did anything to her. Since no one saw anything beyond that, Rose has the ability to say, Leisha ran off, she got in someone else's car, anything to show he was not with her. Because without witnesses or evidence, there's nothing to say that he was. The primary theory which has been presented through the media and the family has always been that after leaving the club that night, Leisha may have been killed when her assailant made unwanted sexual advances and she tried to fight him off. Regardless of who was responsible, it seems the smart money would indicate that the attack and murder did not occur right there in the parking lot, where anyone could have walked out and seen what was happening. More than likely, Leisha would have gotten into her assailant's car, and after leaving the parking lot, the advances were made. Let's face it, if this was some vicious creep looking to assault Leisha sexually or otherwise, he's probably going to drive her to a more isolated spot. With it being around 3 in the morning on a random Thursday, it isn't hard to imagine there may have been a lot of places where such a crime could have taken place. One thing investigators have gone into detail about which continues to confuse them is the manner in which the victim may have been killed and exactly how, when, and where her body was disposed of. They noted that there were two feet of snow on the ground, the temperature that night dropped down to just two degrees, and even the nearby Lake Erie was frozen over. According to historical records, Lake Erie is the most shallow of all of the Great Lakes and as a result freezes more than the rest. However, on average, the lake will see a maximum ice coverage of 80%. The only three times in recorded history that Lake Erie completely froze over occurred in 1978, 1979, and 1996. This means that while much of the lake may have been iced over, the night Leisha vanished, not all of it was frozen. This could make it possible for someone to have taken Leisha's body and gotten it into the lake. Perhaps they would have walked along the thicker areas of the ice and disposed of her body where the ice became fragile and assuming she was weighed down, she could have sunk into the lake. I think it's worth noting that Lake Erie is 241 miles east to west and 57 miles north to south. The average depth of the lake is just 62 feet. However, at its deepest, it reaches down to 210. Assuming the killer was from the area, familiar with the lake, and had experience walking on ice, they may have known exactly where to go to hide her remains, or at least had a good insight of how to get it done. I think it's also worth noting that Lake Erie functions as a natural border between the United States and Canada, and I'd be highly interested to know if the RCMP ever recovered any remains, body parts, or Jane Doe's from the lake in the weeks, months, and years following Leisha's disappearance. Not only would dropping her in the lake possibly create jurisdictional issues should she be found, but it could also result in unaware Canadian law enforcement agencies finding a Jane Doe and not being in contact with either the New York State Police or the West Seneca Police. More than likely, there would be some communication back and forth, but given it's never been mentioned, we simply have no way of knowing. Also, as a side note, I just think it's interesting that I've looked at several cases in which police officers have been involved in a crime, and oftentimes, they'll try and utilize things like jurisdictional confusion to get away with it. Less than four miles west of the Pierce Arrow lies the shoreline of Lake Erie, which in total stretches on for more than 800 miles. Surely, it wouldn't have taken long to drive that short distance, commit an assault, and dispose of the body. If Rose is someone being considered a potential person of interest, then it's both interesting and curious to note that his friends reported he left the bar that night and returned approximately 55 minutes later. If you're generous and say that it would have taken 10 minutes to drive to the lake, and 10 minutes to drive back, that leaves 35 minutes unaccounted for, and Leisha only lived two and a half miles from this bar. I might also add that, at the time, Rose was allegedly living in an apartment on Beach Street in nearby Lackawanna. This location is just over one mile east of Lake Erie and less than 1,200 feet from another waterway called Smoke Creek. While some have said the creek is too shallow to have concealed a body in it for any prolonged period of time, Others noted that there are specific locations where the creek reaches deeper depths and it could make finding remains more difficult. Sticking with a water disposal theory, 
Many people have pointed out that the Casanova Creek curves its way through western New York, passing less than 1,000 feet from the site of the former Pierce Arrow. While some have suggested the possibility that Leisha's remains could have been thrown into the creek, others believe they would have been found quickly due to the fact that the creek doesn't have a great depth, nor a powerful flow, and likely at that time would have been frozen over as well. Others have pointed out that just three miles north of the bar runs the Buffalo River. The Buffalo drains a 447-square-mile watershed and empties into the eastern end of Lake Erie. Running more than eight miles in length at its deepest, the river is 33 feet. Much like Casanova Creek and Lake Erie, the Buffalo is acknowledged as a potential dump site, though it may have faced the same issues with potentially being frozen over. As a final note, I think it's worth saying that while Lake Erie would be accessible purely from the shoreline or via a water vessel, both Casanova Creek and the Buffalo River have bridges crossing them, which could have made dumping a body easier. So, Suffice it to say, there's a lot of water in western New York, and Leisha may have found herself in any number of places, assuming that is how her body was disposed of. Given the utter lack of progress made in trying to find her, many believe this implies she is either in a place that's difficult to search, such as a large body of water, or maybe she was concealed in a spot so rural and remote that no one's come across it yet. We know that a year after Alicia went missing, investigators spent more than two and a half weeks searching through the Chaffee landfill, approximately 27 miles southeast of the Pierce Arrow. Between the bar and the dump, there's a lot of wooded areas where a body could have been buried. The landfill is located on a 500-acre parcel of land, and as a result, it can be a monumental task trying to serve it. Investigators in this instance worked with employees at the landfill to determine where trash was being dumped during the last week of January through the third week of February 1985. The search itself was kicked off when someone called in a tip that Leisha's body might have been thrown in a local dumpster and later picked up and dumped at the landfill without anyone noticing. Both the West Seneca and state police took on the monumental task of trying to find the proverbial needle in a haystack. They brought in tracking dogs, cadaver dogs, helicopters, and heavy equipment. Ultimately, they dug down through more than 30 feet of refuse and garbage in search of any traces of Leisha and never found any. Now, does that mean she's definitely not there? Certainly not. Perhaps the employees were wrong about the dump sites. Maybe someone driving in to dump their truck didn't pull into the right area during that period of time. Or maybe she was brought directly to the dump and concealed there perhaps in an area where police would not have been guided to dig. Unfortunately, there isn't much we can really determine about this theory based on what little information we have. However, I do think it's worth noting that digging was conducted at an undisclosed location in 2017, which might suggest that Leisha was indeed buried, but not at the dump. If we knew where investigators had done that second dig, we might have a better idea of where Leisha may have been taken. There is somewhat of an issue with burial, however. Firstly, there was two feet of snow on the ground, making digging at any location more difficult and complicated. Secondly, the temperature at 3 a.m. was 6 degrees, and by 6 a.m. it was 4 degrees. The ground would have been frozen solid. That's not to say it couldn't have been broken open. It's not to say no one could have dug an impromptu grave, but it certainly would have been more difficult, time-consuming, and challenging. This might suggest that, if indeed Leisha was buried somewhere, her grave might not be very deep, or the killer may have returned to it later and moved it. I think that's something people often forget in this case. Where Leisha was put the night she disappeared may not be where she is now. Perhaps her killer waited for a warmer time of year, or for police heat on him to die down, and then went and moved the remains, maybe finally putting them into Lake Erie, which less than six months later was completely unfrozen. If only we could think of someone who was the last person seen with the victim, though he would deny that despite multiple witnesses contradicting him, someone who disappeared for nearly an hour at the same time the victim did, someone who came back to the bar and went straight to the men's room after that hour passed, someone who left his apartment a short time later and returned at an unknown hour sometime before 10 a.m., someone who called in sick the next day without ever giving a reason as to why and someone who refused to cooperate with the investigation. Can you think of anybody like that in this case? So let's not beat around the bush any longer. 
There's only ever been one person whose name has been connected with this case in terms of the suspicions of investigators, and that is former state trooper Daniel D. Rose. I spent some time digging into Rose's background, which wasn't exactly easy. There were some obvious attempts made to remove him from multiple popular background checking services that I often use. However, you can't remove someone from court records, and there are a slew of newspaper articles dating back to the early 1980s which discuss Daniel Rose's time with the state police, both the good and the bad. Ten weeks after Leisha's disappearance, Rose was terminated from the state police. Neither the police nor Rose or his lawyer have ever given the reasons why this happened. While Rose's lawyer stated that it had absolutely nothing to do with Leisha's case, the state police would only say it came as a result of job performance issues. A writer for the Niagara Falls Reporter, however, wrote in 2006 that he had heard from law enforcement sources that Rose had previously had issues with both violence towards suspects and the vaguely described issues with women. I don't know what exactly that means, and I'm not here to speculate, but to say it doesn't sound good might be an understatement. According to a 1984 article from the Democrat and Chronicle, Rose was sued by a man he arrested for physical assault, which was alleged to have taken place in a Lyons Village police station. Court of Claims Judge Thomas J. Lowry Jr. ordered the state to pay the plaintiff, Bradford C. Burnham, $1,035 in compensatory and special damages to cover medical expenses for a black eye and bloody nose. While criminal proceedings against Officer Rose resulted in an acquittal, Lowry wrote in his five-page decision that, quote, sufficient circumstantial evidence was introduced for the court to infer that an unjustifiable assault did in fact take place, end quote. Burnham, 19 at the time, had been arrested by Rose after creating a disturbance at a Lions area bar known as Tom Jones. Early on the morning of March 3rd, 1982, Rose arrested Burnham, at which time he was charged with harassment and resisting arrest. These charges were later dismissed. During the criminal trial, two police officers testified that Rose took Burnham into a room at the police station and closed the door, telling the officers to disregard any noises they heard coming from the room. Moments later, both officers heard Burnham crying out, What are you doing this to me for? I didn't do anything. The officers quickly opened the door and stated they found Burnham lying on the floor with a bloody nose and that Trooper Rose was standing over him with one hand in the air. Rose testified that he shoved Burnham towards a chair when Burnham attempted to escape the room, resulting in him receiving his injuries. Despite the jury rendering a verdict of not guilty in this case, the state police still suspended Rose for three months following this incident. Outside of this, there have been a couple of different charges Rose has faced in the years since he was dismissed from the state police. There have been two charges of driving while intoxicated in Whitfield and Corning Towns. There were also mentions of charges of criminal mischief, although my own search through court records couldn't find anything alleging this crime. Does any of this mean that Daniel Rose is therefore a vicious and brutal killer who stole away the life of a talented and bright 21-year-old woman? No. As has always been the case, there is sadly zero solid evidence of Rose's involvement in any crime related to Leisha. That being said, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Most people would take the angle that if you hadn't done anything wrong, then you've got nothing to hide. A lot of people have come down hard on Rose for hiring an attorney before speaking to investigators, and while I acknowledge that this ignites a subconscious suspicion about his potential involvement, it's nothing more than an intelligent move. I've said it before and I'll say it again. You should always have a lawyer when you're going to talk to the police. It's just the smart way to handle things. Given that Rose had been a trooper for five years at that point, he would have known better than anyone how tricky an interrogation can be, especially one given by him. That being said, Hiring a lawyer doesn't answer any of the other questions. Rose told investigators he left the bar with a woman named Kathy that night, not Leisha, yet two of his good friends along with other witnesses stated this was untrue and that Rose did leave with Leisha. Rose didn't tell his superiors, nor did he contact West Seneca police when he learned that he was present at a bar the night a woman disappeared from it. That, 
in and of itself is suspicious behavior as being a cop. You would think you would know you have to report that and you might want to help out too. In addition to denying leaving with Leisha that night, he also denied knowing her and claimed he'd only met her this one time. This is odd because multiple newspaper reports describe Rose as a, quote, casual acquaintance, end quote, of Rose's, implying that while they didn't know each other well, they had likely met or at least been at the same place on more than one occasion. The specific details of any connection they may have had, if it is known, has never been revealed. So, Rose tells police he doesn't know Leisha, he didn't leave with her, and he has no idea what may have happened to her. Strangely, despite witnesses saying he walked out with her, he apparently never sees her outside, nor does he see anyone else. It's weird. It's like she walked out the door beside him and immediately turned invisible. When they ask him why he took that next day off from work, having called in sick, he doesn't answer and refuses to divulge any information about where he was, what he was doing, or who he may have been with. This, again, is a problem. You're a state trooper, and yet when you're asked where you were after multiple witnesses state they last saw you with a missing woman, and your answer is essentially, I don't have to tell you anything. Surely, no one can say, prove, or even legally suggest that Rose is guilty, but he seems to have really gone out of his way to make sure he remained a focus for investigators. If you weren't involved, then why not just tell everything you know? Refusing to answer questions certainly doesn't mean you're guilty, but it sure as hell doesn't make you seem innocent either. Given his cold, callous, and disinterested participation in this investigation into Leisha's disappearance, you kind of have to ask yourself, why exactly did Daniel Rose become a state trooper in the first place? It doesn't sound like he was all that interested in helping anyone other than himself. So what do you believe happened here? Did Leisha walk out of that door and into the vehicle of her would-be killer? Did someone manage to trick her into thinking they would be a safe ride home? Does Daniel Rose know more about the circumstances of Leisha's disappearance than he's chosen to share? Patrick Riley went to his grave never knowing what became of his daughter. And now, six years later, her killer remains free to live whatever life he chooses while a father's promise goes unfulfilled. And that's where you come in. Because someone out there knows the truth, and all it will take is one call, one email, one anonymous tip to bring Leisha home where she might receive a proper Catholic funeral and be laid beside her father. Sadly, without new information, the discovery of Leisha's remains or a confession or vital tip, the disappearance of Leisha M. Riley will remain open, unsolved, and growing cold. If you're looking for more information on the disappearance of Leisha Riley, the Buffalo News and Niagara Falls reporter were the most helpful in constructing this episode. Leisha is listed on the Doe Network as 300 DFNY. She's also listed in NamUs as MP2885, and that site includes a report that 18 Jane Does have been excluded as being Leisha. The New York State Police have also created a Facebook page for her which you can find simply by searching for Leisha Riley. If you have any information about the disappearance of Leisha M. Riley, please contact the West Seneca Police Department at 716-674-2280. Her case numbers are 85-0079 and 85-145LI. You can also call Crime Stoppers Buffalo at 716-867-6161 or submit a tip on their website at crimestoppersbuffalo.com. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at traceevpod, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com or comment in the Facebook group. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to thank our very amazing Patreon producers. Thank you to Alicia Townsend, Amy Guthrie, Andrew Guarino, Ann Bertram, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Denise Dingsdale, Donna Buttram, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Eloanne Meyer, 
Fabulous TT, Greg, Guillerme Pinto, Haley Christie, James, Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkowitz, Julie Mangano, Kara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fengel, Leslie B, Marla Wright, Melissa Breckeisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Quinn McBreen, Sarah Lyons, Susie the Cutie, Travis Skepko, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tiffany Nelson, Tom Archer, and Tom Radford. Thank you so much for your amazing support. Without you, this show would not be possible. If you're interested in learning more about this case or other cases featured on the show, please visit trace-evidence.com. There you can find case breakdowns, all social media links, merchandise shops, case descriptions, media, and options for donating, including PayPal and Patreon, should you wish to support the show. This concludes our coverage of the disappearance of Leisha M. Riley. I really believe this case is solvable and someone out there has the answers. Hopefully soon, they'll find the courage to come forward. As a final note on today's episode, I'll be taking next week off to celebrate the holiday. So I want to wish a very happy Thanksgiving to all who celebrate, and I'll see you with a new unsolved case in two weeks.